Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You know, God is a good God. He's awesome. He's wonderful. He's worthy of praise. He's worthy to be praised. Let me just take the time out to greet us tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whether you are streaming from, you know, locally in Jamaica or overseas, we greet you again in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, welcome back. We took a break and we want to continue you know, in our lesson on the dispensation, right? And before we get into the lesson, as a custom, we normally pray, you know, ask God blessing, you know, on, you know, the word. So let us just pray tonight. Lord Jesus, we bless your great name. We magnify you. We glorify you. We lift you up and we exalt you tonight for you alone are worthy, worthy of praise, worthy to be praised. We ask mighty God as we Get into your word tonight that you will be with us, that you will guide, that you will lead, that you will just take full control of the session. We pray, God, that when everything is said and done, that you be glorified and that your people be edified. Let your perfect will be done, we ask tonight, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the last time we were here, we, you know, were discussing the dispensation of promise. Right, and we recognize that the dispensation gained its name because you know God made promise to Abraham and his descendants. He called you know Abraham from his house, from his father's house, and he you know said, Get thee to a place that I will show thee. And then he made some promises to Abraham, and then we recognize that you know he also made the same promises to Isaac and then he reiterated the promises to Jacob right so we recognize that the dispensation got his name got, got its name from you know the promises that God made to these you know individuals right so we're just doing a bit of recap we recognize that from the dispensation really started you know when after the dispersion from the Tower of Babel, and then we recognize from that time until, you know, God called Abraham until the dispensation ended when the children of Israel were, were, were in Egypt and they grew and became a nation, right? So the fourth dispensation is called the dispensation of promise. And we look at the scripture the last time from Genesis chapter 12, you know, and then you know, we look at some other scriptures in Exodus when the people left Egypt. So from one man, God made a nation. So Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, Jacob begat Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, God, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. So he had all these children, and these children now became the, their descendants became the tribe of israel because you know their forefather name was israel right god changed his name from jacob and called him israel so out of this one man abraham their forefather the situation was difficult but god nonetheless specializes in things that are impossible and the somehow you know cause isaac to come forth and then Isaac was in a situation again, you know, because Isaac's wife could not bear. And then, I, and then God worked it out. You know, God just has a way of working out things. And the ch Jacob came. And the wife that Jacob loved, can you see this? The, the, the Abraham, you know, there was a problem. Isaac, I know with Jacob, the wife that he loved could not bear any children. But then God opened her womb and, you know, the 12 tribe came. And they came from different, from, from two mothers, right? And these mothers were sisters. So, God now told Abraham to sojourn to the land that he would promise. Abraham was now in the land of the promise. Isaac was in the land of the promise. And there was a time when famine was in the land. And Isaac was going to go down to Egypt. And God said to him, don't go down to Egypt. Stay in the land that I called you to stay. And I will 
make provision for you, right? Isaac was obedient to the voice of God and he stayed in the land of the promise. But when Israel now, you know, bore his sons, you, you, you know the story well, Joseph, you know, they, they, his brothers did not like him and they swole him into Egypt. And they, he went into Egypt, some folks say, as a forerunner to his family coming into Egypt, right? To make a way for his family coming into Egypt. And when the sons of Jacob, there came another time when famine was in the land, Jacob thought that he would not have seen Joseph again. But then there came a time when famine was in the land and his children now went into Egypt to purchase food. When they were in Egypt, Joseph recognized that these men were his brethren and he disguised himself. And somehow, you know, after a time, he revealed himself to them and said that, yes, we are brethren. And then now the folks went and they told their father and their father talk to God and say, boy, should I go down to Egypt? And, you know, God said, go down to Egypt. God um, was really answering him based on the desires that he had because he wanted to go down to Egypt to, uh, to see his son. And so God said, yeah, man, go down to Egypt. But when these children of Israel went down to Egypt, I think it's about 70 or 72 went down to Egypt. They get comfortable in Egypt, they forgot the command of the Lord because God told them to dwell in the promised land. That was the command that was given to them. And God said, stay here because this is the land. And they went into Egypt and when they went into Egypt, they forgot the command of the Lord. Now, they multiplied and became a nation and the Bible says that there came a fear and there rose up a fear that knew not Joseph, right? And he enslaved them. They were enslaved for about 430 years. The, the burden was so hard on them that they began to cry unto the Lord. And the Lord heard, the Bible said that the Lord heard their cry. And he came now to deliver them. They were told, amen, to apply the blood. Because you, you know the, 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 the fear of um, the prophet. Moses went to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not want to let the people of God go. So, but at the end of the day, God worked it out that the last plague that will happen in the land, that he was going to separate the children of Israel from the other folks, the Egyptians. And they were told now that what it is that they should do, they should apply the blood, bless the name of Jesus, apply the blood on the lintel of the house that they dwell in, so that when the dead angel pass, right, it will not trouble them, right? So the children of Israel were obedient. And let us just look at this passage, Exodus chapter 12. 13. The children of Israel were obedient to this command that they should apply the blood, kill a lamb, and take the blood with Esau and apply it to the lintel of the house. Right? And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. You see, I want us to know, brethren, that there is no deliverance without the blood being applied. If we can remember when we get back, when we look back at the dispensation of innocence, when Adam sinned, Adam and Eve sinned, what did God do? We said that God started a work, and it was a principle that continued to through scriptures. You see, whenever, whenever sin is committed against God, I want you to understand that really life was given up. So in order, if you want to be righteous, is life for life. And so what God did was that he slew a lamb and he used the blood to atone for their sins, but he also used the skin to cover 
their nakedness, right? And we went through that during the dispensation of innocence. But when I see the blood, the Bible says, I will pass over you. There is no deliverance without the blood. When we look even at the dispensation of conscience, the first thing that Noah did when he came out of the ark was that he offered a blood sacrifice unto God. And because of this, what did God say? God said, look here, I am not going to destroy. God was so pleased. It was a sweet smelling savior before God. And God was so pleased. He said, look here, I am not going to destroy the earth again with flood. He made a covenant just because of the blood sacrifice, right? Even in the dispensation, the contents, what was required was that mankind should have come and offer a blood sacrifice before God, the offering. And we saw we were able truth to obey God and Cain did not. So in so 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 the shedding of blood then virgin, it is important. The life the Bible says is in the blood. There is no deliverance in the blood. Right? Life of the flesh, the Bible says in is in the blood. There is no deliverance without the blood. Um, there is no life without the blood. There is no forgiveness without the blood. Hebrews 9 and 22. It says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Right? So there was no deliverance. Virgin, I want us to take note of this. There is no deliverance as we get into the dispensation of the law. No deliverance without the shedding of blood. So the people were delivered, and it was only by obedience to the command of God that they put the blood on the house where they were, the lintel of the door where they were dwelling, and the dead angel passed over, and the children of Israel were saved. And because of this fear, and now let the people go, right? So tonight, now we want to look at the the dispensation of the law, right? And there is just a reminder, we can go to the slides now, there is just a reminder of how it is that we are going to approach, you know, the dispensation. Now we're supposed to know, you know, how we approach it, but we're still going through. We want to say that the, the first thing that we are going to look at is the beginning of the dispensation, you know, who are involved, the time period of the dispensation, and you know, we want to then look at point two, the command that was given and what was expected of mankind, right? Um, look at point three, you know, man's failure to obey God's command. And, you know, as we go down, brethren, we, we, we will see where with every dispensation, God said, look here, these are the things, the command that we're supposed to do. And man fail to obey the commandment. Then we want to look at the judgment that, the judgment that was handed out because, you know, God always handed out judgment. And then we want to look at the mode of deliverance. What, you know, was needed to be delivered or to have salvation in that dispensation. And then, you know, we want to look at one or two takeaways, you know, and what is it that we can learn about the Lord. So let us now look at point one, which is the beginning of the dispensation. And who were involved. So the dispensation of law, right, is really the fifth dispensation. And, you know, it started at Mount Sinai when God gave the law to the children of Israel during the days of Moses. And this you'd have to read now Exodus chapter 9, 19 to 24, and you will see the different laws that God gave to the children of Israel, right? So we're not going to read that now, you know. But I want you, during your spare time, to look through these, to read these chapters, and to see the different laws that were handed down to the children of Israel. So the dispensation started at Mount Sinai, and it continued through the erecting of the tabernacle in the wilderness, right? Remember, they traverse for 40 years, and the dispensation of, of law continued to the journey in the wilderness, the erecting of the tabernacle. They 
period of the judges, where we know about Gideon and so forth, the period of the kings, the period of the captivity, the period of restoration of the remnant and rebuilding and repairing the walls. And it was there during the 400 silent years. And it was the dispensation of law that was still there during John the Baptist because John the Baptist was the forerunner of Jesus Christ that came now to give a shout and say, look here, the Messiah is coming and these are the things that the Messiah will, will, will do and this person is the Messiah. So John the Baptist was the forerunner, right? And he was under the law. So the dispensation of law began when God gave the children of Israel during the days of Moses, right? And it came to an end. It ended with the beginning of the church age in Acts 2, 1 to 4, right? Um, the steward of the dispensation, right? There are many stewards, but these are just some of the most notable names that you would have heard people talk about, heard preachers preach about, heard teachers teach about, you know, from the scripture. Moses was one of the stewards. She was the chief person. Remember, we talk about God calling one man and using that one man as a vessel to, to, to lead the people and to carry out his will, right? And then now the children of Israel, yes, they were a major part of it because the law was given to the children of Israel, right? And so Moses, the children of Israel, John the Baptist, we can go to the next slide. Should have some more names there. Let's go back. Go back to the other slide. But the children of Israel, right? Solomon, Elijah, King David, King Saul. You know, these are so the prophet Samuel was, was one of them. Then you talk about prophets like Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah, Daniel. And these were the sum of like Nehemiah, Ezra, you know. And John the Baptist was also a part, amen, of the, the dispensation of law. And Jesus was also born under the law. The, you know, let us find Galatians chapter 4, right? 4 and 5. But Jesus was also born under the law, right? And so he came and he observed the law. He did what the law required of him to do, right? And the Bible says, that while he was here, he came for a particular purpose. He came for a particular reason. And Jesus gave up his life underneath, under the law. The Bible says, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions of son. So, it was not until the death of Jesus Christ and then now the outpouring of the Holy Ghost where the dispensation of the law ended. But Jesus Christ was one of the persons that walked during the dispensation of the law. Amen. Let us... So most theolo theologians agree that most theologians agree the dispensation covered a span of time of approximately 1,500 years. During this time, almost all the Old Testament books were written. So when we look at all of the books um, that were written in the Old Testament, it was written under the law. Right? Also, during this time, the children of Israel developed as a nation and went through various historical periods. Right? And these, let us go to the other slide now. And some of these historical periods, you know, are, are we have a chart here, the periods of the wilderness and wandering under Moses. Right? And then the 
conquest of Joshua. Remember that Moses could not enter into the promised land because when God said to Moses, you need to speak to the rock, Moses, because these people, these were a stubborn and stiff-necked people, you know, and they, they caused Moses not to enter into the promised land after he led, led them for a number of years. So Joshua now took up the mantle and under the conquest of Joshua, they went into the promised land and they conquered. So the period of Israel history also involved the period of the judges. Remember now that during the time of the judges, every man decided to do what was right in his own eyes. And we'll get to that scripture later. But then, every time they went astray, look how God worked with the people now. Every time they went astray, God rose up a judge, bless the name of God, to deliver the people. Samson and the Philistine, the Philistine came and Samson, God rose him up to deliver. Then there was the period of the kings. Because the children of Israel saw the other nations. And we'll get back to that statement. The other nations a little bit down. Because they saw that the other nations had kings. And their request of God, God give us a king. The period of captivity, like we said earlier on, under the Assyria and Babylonian empires, the, 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 the law, the, these were a part of their history, and they were underneath the law at this time. They were also underneath the law during the period of restoration to the land, you know, and, and Zerubbabel and Ezra and Nehemiah were also a part of, you know, the period and the rebuilding. So the period of history covered by the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they, were, they covered events that were under, under the law. Right? So we went through some of the other people. So now let us look at point two. The command that was given. In the third month, after coming out of Egypt, the children of Israel arrived at the foot of Mount Sinai. So after they came out, they reached, they arrived at the foot of Mount Sinai. The first thing that God did when they reached at the foot of Mount Sinai was that God reminded them of the work that he did to deliver them from Egypt. So at Mount Sinai, this was the place where God would give the children of Israel his law and his commandments. After they arrived at Mount Sinai, God had the message for his people. He reminded them what he did. Let us go to Exodus chapter 14, 30. To 31. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptian. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw the great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptian. And the People fear the Lord and believe the Lord and his servant, Moses. So the children of Israel had seen firsthand the power of God. They have seen firsthand the delivering power of God. And God delivered them out of Egypt. And the first thing that God did when they came to Mount Sinai was that he reminded them of the great work that he did, right? They had seen God made bitter water sweet. And these are the scriptures. I'm going to just quote the scripture and you just write down these scriptures. If you're taking notes, um, they have seen God make bitter water sweet. Exodus 15, 25. They have seen God provided food in the middle of a desert. Exodus 16, 
11 to 15. They had seen how God brought forth water out of the rock. Exodus 17, verse 6. They had seen how God graciously and mercifully. God had been to them in spite of their murmurings and their unbelief. They have seen God's power and greatness demonstrated again and again. So time and time again, they have seen, even when they were murmuring, God still worked on their behalf. So, so imagine now, they saw the great power with which he delivered from out of Egypt. But yet when they were in the wilderness, they murmured time after time after time. And God came through every time. In Exodus 19 verse 5, God made a covenant. And that we call that the Mosaic covenant, right? These laws. And he made a covenant. He, he, he set up everything that he was going to make an agreement. A covenant with the children of Israel, right? This is called the Mosaic Covenant, and it named after Moses, who was the leader at this time. So let us go to Exodus 19. Five to six. Now, therefore, if he will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, bless the name of God, then he shall be a part peculiar treasure unto me above all the people for for all the earth is mine so god was now looking for them this is the covenant that god was ready setting up ready to make with them you know he said if you just obey my voice obey my commandments keep the, keep this covenant that i am going to make with you then i am going to make you a special treasure you can imagine god saying to people or god saying to you as an individual that if you obey his command that he's going to make you a peculiar treasure the treasure is something that you're cherishing hallelujah you can imagine god saying that to a people that he was going to to, to have them precious to his heart Above all the people of the earth. For the earth is mine. Verse 6. And he shall be unto me. Kingdom priests. And a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So God was saying to Moses. Tell the people these things. This is what I want. And I want us to understand, Virgin, that God is a God that I don't know what it is about man, but he wants to have fellowship. He wants to have relationship. He wants to have a people for himself. A people that irrespective of will maintain their covenant with God. So God promised to bless, we can go to the next slide. God promised to bless the children of Israel in a special way. If you would keep, if they would keep their end of the bargain. If you will obey my voice, he said, and keep my covenant. If Israel would only obey, God would bless them. And that is what God said. You know. That is the term of the covenant. This was what we just read in Exodus 19, 5 to 6. Right? So God was saying that if you would just obey, then I would bless. So God promised to bless them in a special way if they would only keep their part of the bargain.
the children of Israel were willing to accept. Let us go to, let us go to this passage. The children of Israel were willing to accept the terms of the agreement. And all the people, so when Moses came in and he, he told the people what the Lord said, all the people answered together and said, all the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. God, God knew what they said about Moses came. Lord, the people said that they are willing to do all that you have spoken. So God said, if you do this, then I will do this. And the people agreed to the terms. So God promised to bless them in a special way. If they keep their part of the deal, if he will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then I would bless. They were willing to accept, willing to accept all that the Lord had spoken. Now, if we read through, through Exodus 19, chapter 19 to 24, which is what we have to read for ourselves, we would read through this chapter, we would realize that there are two types of laws that were given. The moral law and the ceremonial law. The moral law are misfatim, relate to justice and judgment and are often translated as ordinances, right? Um, Misfatim are, is said to be based on God's holy nature. As such, when we look at the commandments, the ten commandments that were given, right? The, the, the ten, the more, there are more, but the, the ten commandments, they spoke to the holy nature of God, right? So their purpose was to promote welfare of those who obey. The value of the law is considered obvious by reason and common sense. The, the moral law encompass, encompasses regulation and justice, respect, sexual conduct, and includes the Ten Commandments. It also includes the penalties for failure to obey the ordinances. But it does not point people to Christ. It is merely a light. It illuminates the fallen state of mankind. And this is the moral law. Then what we call the ceremonial law or the hokim. It refers to the customs of the nation. So the things that the people now began to do over a period of time began to be their customs. Right? And so the word literally translates customs. Right? Our statutes, these laws seem to focus on having the people focusing their attention to God. They include instruction regarding how we should live, the festivals that they, they had at that time, and it, the, the, how they dress, the things that they eat. So these laws deal with that. And it was done. These laws also point to Christ. And they were put there to distinguish the people from the other nations. So let us read Exodus chapter 17. So, so there is about 613. I think I have it there. Yes. There are approximately 613 commandments, you know, that were, are the laws. So the law, the, the Ten Commandments and the, and the other ceremonial laws, about 613. But we only just want to read now Exodus chapter 21 to 17. I'm going to just jump a little bit. 
and we, we just look at the commandments no the ten commandments that were given right because you know the people said that we are willing to obey everything that the Lord said. And the God said, yes, all right, I'm going to give you all of these. And he give them 613. You can imagine. And God speak all these words saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt. You see, this thing was a big thing for the children of Israel, you know. Every time God talked to them, he said, I am the Lord thy God. Remember now, most of the folks that were over 20 died in the wilderness. They died before they came into the promised land. But every time God, you know, taught him, he said, I am the God that brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Right? And he said, thou shalt have, verse, verse 3, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any grave. I want us to listen to this, you know. So we at Exodus chapter 20. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold in guiltiness that take his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy men servant, nor thy maid servant, nor thy chattel, nor thy, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and the earth, the seas, and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Nor is men servant, nor is maid servant, nor is ox, nor is ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. So God gave the commandment. To the children of Israel. And all the commandments. They covered all. Fears of life. And activity. You can go to the next slide. So the children of Israel. Had a great responsibility. Right. So God gave children of Israel, a unique set of law. This was something that no other nation on the face of the earth had ever received. God gave his people 613 commandments in the laws of Moses, according to Jewish calculation, right? These commandments cover all fears of life. We just said it. God had given certain laws to men before Mount Sinai, 
But when we look at these laws that God gave, did we know that when God said, Thou shalt not partake of the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that was a law, that was a commandment that was given. So God had given commandment before Mount Sinai. But we have seen where man feel. So the children of Israel now had a great responsibility. God now put his laws into their hand. Right? Exodus 19, 5. We can look. I think we're ready, but let us look back at it. Exodus 19. God now put his laws into their hands. Now therefore, I, if he will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then he shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all the people, for all the earth is mine. So God now put his laws in the hands of his chosen people, the children of Israel. They had a great responsibility, and this res responsibility was now to obey. So we're looking at point three now, you know, which is the failure to obey God's command. So God was now saying to them, I give you this thing. You now have a responsibility to obey my voice and to keep the commandment that I have given unto you. According to Deuteronomy 6, 1 to 3, Israel was not only to live by these commandments, you know, but they were to teach these commandments to their children, right? And we can look at it. But Israel, we're not only supposed to live by the commandments that the Lord gave them. Because God wants these commandments to move from generation to generation. So they had the responsibility to teach them to their children. Now these are the commandments. The statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you that he might do them in the land where thou go to possess it. That thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command thee thou and thy son, and thy son's son, and all the days of thy life, and that thy days may, might prolong. Hear the for Israel, the law, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee. So you recognize that in all of the writings, the people say, yes, we are willing, but as we look in the different writings, we recognize that if you do God commandment, there is a blessing. And if you don't do it, there is a cursing. And it was for the children of Israel. He said that it might be well with thee, and that he may increase mightily as the Lord thy God of thy father had promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. According to the conditions of the Mosaic covenant, the children of Israel will be blessed for their obedience and they will be cursed for their disobedience. And this is most clearly seen in Deuteronomy chapter 28. So, Obedience is followed by blessings. So verse 1, verse 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, it talks about the blessing. If you obey, if you obey the voice of God, if you obey the commandment of the Lord, these are the blessings that will follow. You, you have the scripture? And it shall come to pass, if thou hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee and I above all 
nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon thee and overtake thee if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Blessed shall thou be in the city, and blessed shall thou be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy cattle, the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall be thy basket and thy storehouse. Blessed shall thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shall thou be when thou goest out. So, once they obey the commandment of God, there would be blessings and from, from, from the Lord. The very When God proposed to the people that he was going to do a covenant, this was what God said to them. If you do it, then I will set you apart from all the people on the earth. And it continued. And he said, look here. Bless will you be in the city, blessed in the field, blessing your sporos, blessing your flocks. Once you are obeying the commandment, all that the Lord has commanded, the Bible says. But then look at, you know, from verse 15, disobedience is followed by a curse. But it shall come to pass, if thou will not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Curse shall thou be in the city, and curse shall thou be in the field. Curse shall be thy basket and thy storehouse. Curse shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy land, the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Curse shall thou be when thou comest in, and curse shall thou be when thou goest out. Amen. We can go to the next slide. So, there is a principle, brethren that is established from the first dispensation. I want us to understand that this thing is not new, but God now chose to emphasize it within this dispensation of law. Because when Adam and Eve disobeyed the voice of God, the command of the Lord, God cursed them. They would remain blessed if they had stayed and remain obedient to the command of God. But because they choose to sin against God, He cursed them. When we jump down to the second dispensation, we recognize that Abel's offering was accepted by God. And because Abel offering was accepted by God, it naturally meant that Abel was blessed. But when Cain offering was not accepted, and, and this was one of the real reasons why he was, he was upset, you know, because he would not be blessed. So the principle was there from the, from the first dispensation. We saw it in the second dispensation. So God gave him space to repent, and he did not, and, God, and, and time elapsed, and God what? Curse him. And when God cursed him, bridging, the man said, look here, it, was, it is too much for me. So it is clearly pointed, now, pointed out now in this dispensation of law that if you obey the commandment, if you do what I say you must do, then I am going to bless. If you don't do it, then these curses will come upon you. So God, tell them what they are going to get into. 
He tell them that if you obey, this is what's going to happen. And he tells them, look here, God know that they could not keep this entire law. But what God expect, it was that to the best of their ability, they should have tried and kept it. So some folks want the blessings of the Lord. But they don't want to serve God. So the principle still stands today. We are not under the dispensation of law, but the principle was there from the first dispensation. And it continued through all the dispensation. And it's here today under the dispensation of grace if you choose to obey the word of God. God will automatically bless you. And if you choose to disobey, God will curse. Sometimes folks say, look here, I want the blessings of the Lord, but they refuse to serve God. There are folks who are also filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you know, filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, meet the plan of salvation, but want to live according to their worldly loss. And still expect that God is going to bless them. I want you to understand, Virgin, that it doesn't work like that with God. Why would, I, why would God, that is a holy God, require holiness, require for a person to walk upright according to his laws, to his statutes, and Living contrary to that, but expect God to pour you out a blessing. The prince will remain the same. God told them that if you do these things, I am going to bless. And if you don't do these things, then I am going to curse. So it doesn't work like that, Virgin. We cannot, we cannot expect to get the blessings, but we don't want to live the life that God. I am not saying that there is not going to be ups and there is not going to be down. There are mountain tops and valleys. God, the, the, the songwriter said, in the valley he restores my soul. So God will carry us through certain things, Virgin. So, so it, but I want you to know that if you read, and the blessings of God doesn't necessarily mean material things, you know. Let us find 1 John 2, 7 through to 11. It's on the next slide. So, it doesn't work like that, Virgin. So, if God say, You're supposed to be obedient to his command and you will bless. Or if you don't do it, you will curse. Then the, the obvious thing to do as an individual, you'd want to be blessed. So which means that we're supposed to just obey the commands of the Lord. So blessings for obedience. Person for disobedience. And this is obedience to the word of God. This is obedience to the word of God. The word of God says you will be blessed. So the Apostle John said in 1 John, the Apostle John said in 1 John 2, 7, 2 to 11, Mr. Virgin, I write no new commandment unto you. But an old commandment which he had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which he have heard from the beginning. And see again, a new commandment I write unto you. Which thing is true in him and in you? Because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. 
he that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even unto now. And he that loveth his brother abideth in the light and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whether he goeth because the darkness had blinded his eyes. You see, sometimes, brethren, it is hard to love. Sometimes folks make, makes it hard for you to love them. But this is the commandment of God. He said you should be supposed to love your brother as yourself in this dispensation. So if you hate your brethren, and I don't know why the Holy Ghost is leading me here. If you hate your brethren, you are disobeying the command that God says that you're supposed to live by. You're supposed to love your brother as yourself. But we come to the house of God and we have things, we have hatred in our heart for our brother. We dislike our brother. We dislike the very groom that him walk on. We don't talk to the person. Hallelujah. We don't deal with the person. If the person come to greet you, you don't want to greet them. They come in to greet you, you make sure you walk on the other side. Brethren, I, I want you to understand that we, we, we hurt in our own selves. So don't try to live this way and expect that God is going to bless you. Don't try to live this way and expect that God is going to bless you. When you, you hate your brother and the word of God say, love thy neighbor as thyself. So the children of Israel say, all glory to God. The Lord said, we will do all, everything that God said we will do. So do the Lord told the children of Israel, what will happen if they were disobedient to his command? The children of Israel did not live up to the commands. That they say that they would live by. They said all that the Lord had spoken. We will do. But they broke the covenant. They fail to keep the law of God. They fail to follow the commandments of God. They fail to live up to the statutes of the Lord. The commandment that God gave them was broken in a hurry. Let's go to the next slide. Look at this. Remember when we read, we were reading the, 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 the Exodus chapter 20. I told us that we should note that we were reading Exodus chapter 20. So no further that, no sooner than God gave them the laws in Exodus chapter 20. Look at what happened in Exodus chapter 32, verse 1 through to 6. Moses now went up into the mountain to talk with God. God was about to now give him the commandments and tablets of stone. And when the people saw that Moses delay coming 40 days, you know, everything that the Lord said that we were going to do gave us his words. We were willing, yes, God, we are going to do it. Moses returned to the Lord with the words of the people, we are going to do it. And when the people saw that Moses delayed 
to come down from the mountain. The people gather themselves. This was just for 40 days, you know. The people gather themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, oh, make us gods. This was the same thing that God just tell us to don't do. Don't make no other gods. From image, whether it be something that you see on earth, whether it be something that you see in the sea, something that you see, don't make no other gods. Exodus chapter 20 he said that them, to them too. This is Exodus chapter 32. Yes, some time would have elapsed. But they were still at place. Mount Sinai. They pitched there for a while. And the people saw that Moses delayed. And they gathered themselves unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land and Egypt, we what not what has become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break up. Look here. So, because I have the question, you know. Aaron was with Moses every step of the way. The people looked up to Aaron. That is why the people went to him. And Aaron put up no form of resistance and said, look here, give him some more time. The people came to him. Verse 1 and verse 2, he said, look here, break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. This was the man that was there that God sent with Moses to Pharaoh. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And, and, and the man offered no resistance. The man offered no support to Moses who was with God for 40 days. And all people broke off the golden earrings, which were in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand, and fashioned it with a graven tool after he had made a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which Oh, glory to God. Which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt when God, bless the name of Jesus, was about to make covenant with them. The first thing that God did was what? Hallelujah. The first thing that God did was to tell them that I brought you up out of the land of Egypt. But a calf was made and they said, this is the God that brought us up out of the land of Egypt. Exodus. 20. They were still in the same place. Moses gone to get the tablets and the people made a golden car. And when Aaron saw it, he built, oh God, he built an altar before it and Aaron made proclamation and said, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the morrow and offered burnt offering and brought peace offering. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. That play there was talking about that the people have an orgy, right? When Moses came down from the mountain, people were naked. That is what idolatry does. That is what idolatry, idolatry does. Brings you into sexual immorality. So the history of, 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 of the Israel of nation is a flagrant and persistent violation of breaking God's law. No sooner than they broke it in an hurry, no sooner than God gave them the commandment. Amen. They left Jesus and began to do their own thing. After this great sin, God said, they have turned aside so quickly 
out of the way which I have commanded them. Exodus 32, verse 8. You say they have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made a molten calf and, high, and have worshipped it and have sacrificed their unto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which I have brought thee up, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff naked, glory to God, it is a stiff naked people. Now therefore, let me alone, that I might, that my wrath may wax against them, that I may consume them. And I will make up thee a great nation. This is what God was saying to Moses, you know. Let me just finish them up. And we make of you, Moses, a great nation. During the period. During the period of the judges. Every man, the Bible said, did what was right in his own eyes. They had the commandment. They said that they would follow it. And every man did what was right in his own eyes. So from him, see it as right. You know, this is what he decided that he was going to do. I want you to, to know, Bridget. I want you to know. They turn aside so quickly out of the way which God commanded them. And it continued during the time of Judges. Every man said, this is right and this is what I am going to do. During the period of the judges, the children of Israel did not follow God's law. But in, instead, every man did what was right in his own eyes. Like I've been saying, during this time, most of the, during the time of the kings, the Israelites served idols. They ignored God's law. Not through all of the kings, you know. But most, they serve other gods. Whereof the Lord said unto them, he shall not do this thing. Israel's failure can be seen by reading 2 Kings 17, right? And you take note of verse 15 and 19. We're not reading it. But later on, the children of Israel committed a greater crime. Was that the same laws? Was that the same laws that pointed to Jesus Christ. They crucified him. They said, give us Barabbas, which was a criminal, and crucified Jesus. It was a crime that they, they, they do everything. The high priest did everything to get rid of Jesus, you know. And the people say, yes, give us Barabbas. And they committed a greater crime. But not all the Jews feel there were some Jews who believed in God and gave their very best at living at the law. Their very best at keeping his law, his law and commandment. John the Baptist's parents kept the law in this way. And you can look at um, Luke 1, 5 and 6. Though they did not keep it perfectly, but they tried their very best to keep the law. But for the most part, the children of Israel fail to keep the law that they were given. The law that they agreed to and said, we will do everything that God said. Fear. So when we look at the first dispensation, 
God give a command, failure. Second, failure. Third, failure. Fourth, failure. So we're on the fifth dispensation now. And man still fail to live according to the commandment of the Lord. Let us look at now point four. The judgment that was handed out. So we have already seen the disobedience to God's law. And we have seen that if they are disobedient, then, you know, the curses will, will follow. So I want us to know, brethren, that the children of Israel, they continued instead of serving God. They followed what they saw around them. God took them out and he wanted them to be a peculiar people. He wanted them to be a people that all the nation of the earth will look upon. But they look over and saw what the neighbors were doing and that is what they wanted to do. So they continued and the curses that were spoken of now in Deuteronomy now start rolling out. God bore with them long. For he's a long-suffering God. Bore with them long. But there come a time when God now start act. And when God start act, it's only God alone can save you. So he start act and him alone can save you. So, the three of the great judgments now that fell upon the nation of Israel are these. One, the Assyrian captivity, which was up now about 722 BC. And we can find that in 2 Kings 17, 3 to 6. We are going to read that one. So they because of their disobedience, God now decided that he's going to know, put them into captivity. Against him came up Shalmaneser, king of Assyria. And Hoshea became his servant and gave him presents. And the king of Assyria found conspiracy in Hosea. For he had sent messengers to, to Saul, king of Egypt, and brought no presents to the king of Assyria, as he had done year by year. Therefore, the king of Assyria shut him up and bound him in prison. Then the king of Assyria came up throughout all the land and went up to Samaria and beseech it three years. In the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away into Assyria and placed them in Pala and in Habor by the river of Gozan and in the city of Medes. Medes. Right? So, let us go to the verse 7. For so it was that the children of Israel had sinned again. So this passage now, you know, is giving us the reason why God put them into captivity. The passage is now saying, For so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, which had brought them up out of the land of Egypt, for under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods. Go to verse 8. So God brought them up, you know, out of Egypt. And God know because of their obedience, them into captivity because they were disobedient to the commandment of God. And look what verse 8 says now. And walk in the status of the heathen which the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel and of the kings of Israel which, had, which they had made. 
So I want you to understand bridging because I, I want to point out something here from verse 8. The children of Israel walk in the status of the Eden. God called them and God gave them the command. But they were still, while God gave them the command, they were still looking at the other nations around them. They were looking at what the other nations around them were doing. And instead of focusing on what God told them to do and what they made an agreement to do, they started to do the things that the heathen was doing. The same people that got cast from before them. They were doing the things of the Eden. And virgin, it is the same thing that is happening in the church today. God call us out, you know, him say what? Come out from among them and be a separate, say the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. The Bible says so. Him call us out. But some folks want to be in the church. And they want to be doing the things that the heathen is doing. They want to live by the statutes of the Eden. And at the same time, they are in the church. Oh, glory to God. Bible says, cannot serve two masters. It can't work like that, virgin. God call you into holiness. And the heathen practicing unrighteousness. And we are in the church. And we are looking out on what the, the heathen is doing. And want to do the same thing that the heathen is doing. It can't work like that. If this is how we are living. Know that we are doing ourselves harm. It is only a matter of time before God acts. God alone, he, he, he tried to correct the, 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 the children of Israel time after time. And they took no heed. And God now placed them into captivity. It's the same thing that will happen to us, virgin. God will put us into some tough situations if we fail to walk according to what he says. It is a terrible thing. To fall into the hands of God. So he, he you know, ten nations, is ten, ten tribes, right? Made up this, this section of Israel. Because remember, after Solomon's son, I think it's Rehoboam, right? He increased the, 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 the task and they, and they split. So when the Assyrian captivity happened, it happened to the to ten tribes. But then look at point the, the next slide. The Babylonian captivity. So you would have expect now that Judah would have seen and said, look here, we are going to now shape up ourselves because God put them under captivity because they disobeyed the command. So let us shape up ourselves. Oh God, I remember now the temple of God, you know, was on was on their side. Because when the split happened, the king at that time split up something for them to worship false God because he did not want the tribe, the other tribes, to go up to Jerusalem to worship. And so they should have looked on. Bless the name of Jesus and said that, you know, we see what happened. So we are going to change. So the Babylonian captivity took place about 605 BC. With them destroying the temple in 586 BC. So the southern kingdom of Judah was carried away captive by the mighty Babylonian army. And you can look at that. In, in Second Kings, you have the scripture there. 
And the reason for this, you can look at 2 Chronicles 36, 14 to 17. The reason for this was because they disobeyed the command of the Lord. In, and then the third one. The destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans, 70 AD. So the city of Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed by the Romans. So remember now, there was a, a decree that went out from King Darius and said, look, you rebuild. And they rebuild the temple under tension. But then because the people were disobedient to God, the Roman Empire came. And they destroyed the city of Jerusalem and the temple. They destroyed everything. And at this time, they were scattered right through the world. This was a part of their judgment, you know. They scattered right through the entire world. And you have the scriptures there for that. The reason for this judgment, again, was because they were disobedient to the command of God. They rejected Jesus Christ. St. John 1, 11, For he came unto his own and they received him not. But to as many that has received him, to them gave he power to become the son of God. So they came to him. He came to be their savior. But they were looking for a king that came in glory. They wasn't looking for anybody that was born in a major. And so they say, away with him. They rejected him. And Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD, right? So we have looked through the different dispensations and we recognize that with all of the dispensations, you know, man continuously failed to live by the commandment of the Lord. Amen. Let's go to the next slide. So now we're looking at the mode of deliverance. So the mode of deliverance was simply obedience to the commandment of God. Like all of the other dispensations, we recognize to be delivered from the wrath, from the judgment, really is just to be obedient to the command of the Lord. However, when a person sin, when, when a person sin under the dispensation, so God gave now the commandments and he said, these are what you are supposed to do. But when a person sin now, that is why you have the, 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 the ceremonial laws. And so when a person sin, he had to now offer the sin offering. A sin offering was a sacrifice made according to a blood sacrifice made according to what God stipulates, right? The Hebrew phrase for, Hebrew phrase for the sin offering is literally means false offering. The sin offering was made for sins committed in ignorance. And, and if you look through it, you don't see anything pertaining to sins, presumed for sin, knowingly make the decision to sin, right? It was really, um, the, the, and the Bible mentioned it in a sin committed in ignorance. Hallelujah. And you recognize that in the time that we are living, people willfully make up their mind and say, I am going to do this thing. Under the dispensation of law, there was, there was no space, so to speak, for any presumptuous sin. Was only sin committed out of ignorance, mighty God, or unintentional sin. So the ritualistic method of sin offering was the animal to be offered. Very was an animal to be offered. Very varied, depending on the status of the sinner. So, for example, if the priest sin, right, unintentionally, right he would offer a young bullock. And if the king or a prince sin, 
they would offer a young male goat. But people in like the private sector, so to speak, would sacrifice a young female goat or a lamb. Unless they were, and, and if they were her, right? They had to offer turtle doves and pigeons. So if you want to look at the full details of that, you can look at Leviticus chapter 4, right? And Numbers chapter 15. Again, sin offering was a sacrifice. When a person sin unintentionally by breaking one of the Lord's commandments, you know, and later realized and felt guilty, right? The, the sin offering was for that. They were also part of the ceremonies on the day of atonement. So when a person, one time per year now, and we can find Hebrews chapter 9, verse 7. So a one time per year, you know, they used to come, come and offer this, right? So le le let me just read what I have. So on the day of atonement, the high priest would make two sin offering. A bull for himself and a young male goat for the congregation. So what the congregation would come and do now is, you know, rest the man on the goat because it really is like a transfer, they transfer the sin to the goat and the goat would be slaughtered. Remember, we started out by saying, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin and it was blood that was used to deliver, bless the name of God, the children of Israel out of Egypt. And we have now seen it in this dispensation where it was the shedding of blood again. We saw it in the first dispensation. It was the shedding of blood. Why Adam received forgiveness. And the same thing happened under this dispensation. So the mode of salvation was the shedding of blood. For them to be obedient to the commandment of God. And because this was a part of the commandment, how it is that they were supposed to offer the sin offering, how is it that they were everything God written down, and they say everything we will do. So let us go to the passage, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 7. But unto the second, when the high priest, this was the, 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 the beyond the veil now, you know, when the high priest, only one time per year, like you see, like when you're doing your reading now, you will record, you will read and understand that when the high priest was going inside the holies of holy, he had to tie a rope around him, glory to God, and he had to have bells on him so that when he went in now to offer, and he did it one time per year. And you read the scripture said, not without blood which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost, the signifying that the way into the holies of all was not yet made manifested, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. So the, the priest, now when he went into the tabernacle, the, the, the tabernacle, the holy of holy, once per year, he had to tie, they had to tie a rope on him. And he had to have bells. So when he offered up the blood sacrifice, if it was accepted, then the presence of God would cause him to, to dance, so to speak. And they would hear the bells ringing and them say, yes, they would rejoice. They say, yes, with sins forgiven. But if they don't hear any bells ringing, they have to draw out the priest because you know what happened to him? dead yeah, that is why he had to go in there with a rope around him so brethren this was how it was for them to receive forgiveness under the dispensation of law So the live animal was, was, was brought to the altar. And the sinner was required to what? Lay his hand on the head of the animal. Leviticus 4.29. So we can read that during our spare time. Then the animal was killed. At which point the priest would take some of the blood. And put it on the horns of the altar. In some cases. 
some of the blood was also sprinkled inside of the tabernacle, then all the rest of the blood would be poured at the base of the altar. Right? And there were, were instructions of how they should do it. The, the, the fat was to be burned, fat was to be removed and burned. And, and some of the instruction was that the priest could eat a portion of the meat. And everything was written in the laws. Amen. Let us go now to point six. Right. So looking at one of the takeaways now, you know, I, I, I really like, I really like, you know, how, you know, as I do the study, you know, there, I just find different, you just like me see God in a different light. Virgin, you know, one of the things that we, that I take away, you know, is that God put things in, in place beforehand. What do I mean by this? When I now look at the dispensation of innocence, I recognize that, you know, a, m everything that man would need was put in place, bless the name of Jesus, before God made man. So all of the, the vegetables, everything that was needed, the fruit, God put them there first. And then when he made man, man was there and man had no need. And it is the same God that says, I will supply all your need according to my riches in glory. I want you to understand, just straight and little, that God knows you as an individual. He knows everything that you will have need of. And God, from before time began, put those things in place. Before you came to the point, it's just a matter of you waiting. So he put man in the garden and he, and he, and he, and he put everything that man needed before he placed man in the garden. God knows man more than man knows himself. He knows what we have need of before we need it. He knows the things that we will do. Listen to where I'm going. He knows the things that we will do before we do them. That is why he put guidelines in place and that is why he put commands in place. Before we do them. Oh God. I hope somebody get this one. So when he made Adam, what did he tell Adam? Say, he said, Adam, of every tree, Genesis 2, 17, he said, Adam, this tree that is in the midst of the garden, don't eat of this tree, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. God is from everlasting to everlasting. He's in, in the everlasting past and he's in the everlasting present. Which means that God knows what man is going to do before man does it. So God was able to say to Adam, Adam, don't do this thing. Because God knew that Adam would do it. And the commandments and the statutes that are there are a guideline to help us to live for God. So God knew that Adam would eat from the tree and God gave the commandment beforehand. Adam, don't eat. He knew the tendency of men. He knew the tendency of human beings that we will choose to go a certain path. And so what he places there is a way to guide. It's a fence for us not to go over. So in this day and age, God knows our tendency. He knows 
there are certain things that we will do. And so what God does is that he places guidelines in, in the scripture to help us to live. Sometimes you teach these guidelines, you preach these guidelines, and persons are still hell-bent on going against these guidelines. You can imagine. Glory to God. God said, he, know, he knows that you are going to do the thing. And so him have it written in the scriptures before you arrive. But yet still, we want to go outside of the statues, outside of the commands. That, that is why he gave, he gave them. He knew that Israel, all the things that he told Israel not to do, he knew that they would do them. And so he put them in place and said, Israel, don't do these things. Because I can see the future and I know that you are going to do them. But I put them in place to help you, to guide you not to do them. And guess what? Israel did them. It's the same thing happening today. The things are written in scripture. Don't do this. Don't dress a certain way. But we refuse to do it. Why? God knew that, knew that our tendency is to do these things. And that is why I wrote them in the scripture. And guess what? Oh man, you are inexcusable because it is written there. So, so, so really, so really, my takeaway from this virgin that speaks, it speaks so low to me that, that God really put the thing there to help me as a Christian to live for him. Yes, he gives me the Holy Ghost, you know, and the Holy Ghost will lead me to all truth. But, but, but God, the thing in the scripture the thing in the scripture and says this is what you are supposed to do you can imagine I want to encourage us as we look at this takeaway Bridget. God put the guideline in place beforehand put the guideline in place I want to encourage us Bridget, that we make sure Oh, glory to God, that we observe the guidelines and that we try to live according to the guideline because God knows our tendency, He knows our tendency, our tendencies, and He put these things in place to help us, bless the name of Jesus Christ, to live a life that is pleasing and acceptable in His sight. Let us go to the next slide. All right, we're going to skip that slide, go to the, the other one. So we're going to point seven. Ah, yes. So what, what is it that we can learn about God? God is often forgiving. And, you know, we, we know these things about God, but when we look at this dispensation, this is one of the things that came out because God selected a people, right? Um, and he wanted them to, his glory to the entire world. But these people that he selected, it is he, God said that they were a stiff naked people, you know. It is he, God, that came to the point when he was going to destroy the people. Hallelujah. And Moses had to say, Lord, no, unless the Egyptian might say, you're a, you're a God that carried them out in the wilderness to slaughter them. Moses had to intercede on the people's behalf. But I want us to know, Bridget, that God is often forgiven, forgiving. He stands ready to answer the prayer of repentance. So if a person recognizes that he's a sinner, and stands ready to repent right away. God is ready to answer that prayer. 
I remember years ago when, because I was baptized from I was young, 13 years, years old. But, but, I did this tea in church. And I remember that night, there was just this conviction. And I said, I said, God, this is it. Forgive me of my sins. Ooh, genuine repentance. Now, you, know. you see, when I finished prayer, prayer, Virgin, I feel, I feel, I feel different. Can't really explain to you, but I feel clean when I repent. And I just tell myself that God, this, I'm going to serve you. No, I'm going to serve you. But there was a calling there, you know. Because no man comes to God except God will call him, right? God draws him. So, I want you to know, Bridget, that when you are at the place when you are ready to repent, you're, you, you have a repented heart. Amen. God stands ready to hear your prayer of repentance. The, the, the show you how God is, is forgiven. The Jews went astray many times, yet God signed it in Himself to forgive them over and over. Over and over, He forgave them. And I want us to know, Bridget. So God said, I have, I have seen a people that are stiff decked. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and destroy them that I will make you a great nation. But Moses sought the favor of the Lord God and said, Lord, why should your anger burn against your people? whom you brought out of Egypt with a great power and a mighty hand, why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that you brought them out to kill them in the mountains and wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce anger. Relent and do not bring disaster upon your people. Through the different generations, of Israel, God was willing to forgive his people time and time again. Like we said earlier on, God rose up prophets to warn them, right? And the people refused. Today, God is still the same. He changes not. He's the same yesterday, today, and forget forever. And God is willing to forgive us of any sins that we committed. Let us find that last scripture. Any sins that we commit, God is willing to forgive us. Once we come to the point and we say, Lord, forgive us, God will forgive us. Look at it. My little children, John said, right? He said, these things I write unto you that he sin not. And if any man sin, we have a what? Advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. We have somebody that will intercede on our behalf. But we have to recognize and this is with repentance. You have to recognize that. Yes, I'm going to do something wrong. And yes, the thing is wrong. And then we ask for forgiveness. God stand ready and willing to forgive us of our sins. God don't want anybody to die in their sin. It's not his will, the Bible says, for any to perish. But that all should come to repentance. God bless us tonight. I pray that, you know, the Lord would have spoke to your heart and, you know, if there are any changes that we have to do because all of this, you know, is really just to help us to be better Christians, right? And if there's any changes that we recognize that we need to make, that we make them under God, God stands willing and ready to hear a repented prayer. God bless you tonight in the name of the Lord. God's willing next week, next time, same place we will come and we will look at the dispensation of grace. And that is the dispensation of the church age, the dispensation that we live in right now. So God bless you tonight. Thank you for tuning in. And we pray God's richest blessing upon your house, upon your life. Remember, if you'll be obedient to the command of God, to the word of God, these blessings shall overtake 
glory to God. And if you are disobedient to the commandment of God, the curse shall overtake you. Father, we thank you, Jesus, for the words tonight. We pray, God, that they would have accomplished that which you intended to. We pray, God, that you bless every heart that tune in. Lord, even those that will look at the, 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 the video in future, we pray, God, that a blessing will go, that an anointing will go, God, that will cause a change. We pray, God, that you bless every household, bless every individual, that you will cover us. And most of all, Lord Jesus, that you give us a desire to serve you. We pray, God, that your perfect will be done as we give you thanks right now in Jesus' name. Amen. So God bless you.